where once the Empire blazed forth in glory, now only its walls still stand. The forces of Chaos, Gog, and Magog have gathered at the gates. The sound of a trumpet whistles through the air on the wind. Perhaps a sentry calling out a warning to those who still remain to take their posts and prepare to fight. But when the wind stops, so too does the sound of the trumpet. Alas, it was not a trumpet at all, but the wails of the wind blowing through long emptied halls and towers. A loud crash echoes through the emptiness. Not a cannon firing a warning shot, but another building collapsing into dust. Another piece of the history falling into ruin. The king has been asleep for so long that no one remembers his name. Realizing there is no one left to defend the Empire, that all that remains of it is this empty shell, its once formidable walls now undefended, the forces of chaos swarm through the gates and subsume everything in their path. The traces left by the civilizations of antiquity, carved into ancient stone in the form of mysterious monuments scattered about the earth, or etched into our collective memories as myths and legends, the origin of which no one remembers, are a testament to the kinds of civilizations the world of tradition produced. It was lasting. And while nothing on this physical earth can ever be truly eternal, these echoes of tradition come as close as we may find within the bonds of materiality, reflecting those divine principles which are truly eternal. These primordial remnants stand as tombstones to remind us of that which was once alive. Will our modern cities and monuments stand the test of time as a symbol of eternal principles? No, we no longer build to last, but to consume and destroy. While traditional civilizations consumed time, modern civilizations instead consume space. What have we built that can rival the glory and grandeur of the ancient civilizations whose majesty still remains evident even in the most crumbled of ruins. Instead, we engage in the endless construction of buildings which will look dated in twenty years and torn down within a hundred. We create cheap art made from recycled rubbish that cannot be distinguished from the trash heap from which it was pulled. We build megachurches devoid of any spiritual life, designed to pack as many bodies as possible into something resembling a warehouse but has nothing to offer for the glory of God. And we tear down all reminders of a greater past and erect only transient monuments of neon arches to consumerism. We have built a world that is no longer fit for organic life, but is only suitable for machines. What will our world leave as a testimony to those who uncover its ashes in 10,000 years' time?
History is replete with examples of the rising and falling of nations. A nation, in its time, may see its ascendancy, a brief period of dominance, and then its seemingly inevitable decline. Every civilization contains within it the seed of its own death, and while each collapsed civilization may seem to have widely varying factors to blame, the inherent seed of death is the same for them all. This may seem unbelievable to the modern student of history, who might rush to point out how one collapse is completely different from another, and it is indeed true that the outward appearances of decline can take on many different forms. However, those things which are most often blamed are but mere material symptoms. We must first understand something of the nature of ancient civilizations, based as they were, to greater or lesser extents, on the world of tradition. Unlike modern people, the people of antiquity did not believe that they were all eventually doomed to perish, but rather that their empires were eternal. Evola writes in The Bow in the Club, It is quite typical to mistake for immobility what in civilizations with a traditional orientation possessed a very different meaning, immutability. Those civilizations were civilizations of being. They showed their strength precisely in their identity, their triumph over becoming, over history, change, and the amorphous flow of things. These civilizations plunged deep, beyond the shifting and treacherous waters, and in the deep they firmly rooted themselves. And in the same book he also writes that traditional civilizations were dizzying in their stability, in their identity, in their subsisting in an unwavering and changeless fashion in the midst of the current time in history, so much so that they even succeeded in lending sensible, tangible expression to eternity. We have spoken previously about the Empire as a physical manifestation of the Divine Order on Earth, a Divine Order which is eternal. So long as the Empire adheres to an accurate reflection of that Order, that Empire would indeed be eternal. We have also spoken of the Sacred King, who functions as the axis of light and eternity around which the Empire turns and finds its stability in his victorious and supernatural presence as divine immanence on earth. And we have spoken as well of the sacred rites performed throughout all strata of society, from the king to the priests to the fathers, always reenacting the divine stories that reflect the deep metaphysical truths of the universe. In the world of tradition, Every aspect of daily, exterior life was an approximation of a rite, living in alignment with the law from above, and the hierarchical bonds between the upper and lower castes allowed everyone in society to approach the supernatural. The lower castes may not have had sacred rites in the same way that the priests and patricians did, but by living in alignment with the law from above, they kept themselves free from sin, from error, from the things that lead one further into the illusion of materiality and away from the connection with divinity and the metaphysical reality. The modern conception is that such hierarchies and caste systems existed primarily to serve those at the top first and foremost, but in the world of tradition it benefited everyone, and especially those at the bottom. Those at the top of the hierarchy could theoretically achieve spiritual liberation on their own without the structure of a traditional society, although it would be more difficult without the support and order that civilization brings. But those in the lower castes often cannot achieve spiritual liberation at all without the stewardship of the learned masters at the top. Those spiritual elite at the top of the hierarchy light the supernatural fires for those who cannot do it for themselves. In a traditional civilization, everybody serves this hierarchy in their own natural capacity, fulfilling their own svadharma, to borrow the Sanskrit term, and as such, 
everybody benefits from this hierarchy even if they do not grasp the higher meaning of it, simply because the higher guiding principles from above rippled through all levels of the hierarchy and provided a structure and orientation for civilization as a whole. Thus, it is the duty of those at the top who have the power of the rights to maintain law and order in their metaphysical and esoteric sense as well as in their more profane and exoteric sense. When civilization begins to deteriorate, it is the fault of those at the highest rungs of society, abandoning, neglecting, or changing the rights, even in the slightest way, opens the door for a relapse into chaos. The material world is prone to entropy, bounded as it is by space and time. One must always work to maintain order and keep chaos at bay. When a king neglects the rights and his spiritual center wavers, the consequences reverberate throughout all of society. If the paterfamilias neglects his family rights, it affects only his family. But the loss of rights from the apex of the hierarchy begins the degeneration process of civilization and also reopens the path of the ancestors in the afterlife while simultaneously closing the path of the gods. It is interesting to note that the rights of the founding deity of many civilizations are often centered around the death and rebirth story of the patron god. The rites are regenerative. They renew, restore, and reinvigorate both the god and those performing the rites through the continual re-establishment of the cosmic order. The loss of this regenerative element by default leads to degenerative effects on a society and its people. Where once a nation was virile and life-affirming through its regular regenerative contact with the divine, the degenerate nation has only death in its future. When the path of the gods, the path to the true life, is barred to the people, when only death and dissolution await them, a society naturally becomes life-denying. Evola writes, At this level, to leave the parameters of tradition meant to leave the true life, to abandon the rites, alter or violate the laws, or mix the castes, corresponded to a regression from a structured universe back into chaos, or to relapse to the state of being under the power of the elements and of the totems, to take the path leading to the hells, where death is the ultimate reality, and where a destiny of contingency and of dissolution is the supreme rule. Evola states that he does not believe that the cause of civilizational decline can be attributed solely to naturalistic or historical factors, and he references Arthur de Gobineau's work titled Essay on the Inequality of Human Races as one which has most comprehensively outlined the insufficiency of the majority of the empirical causes which most modern historians tend to attribute as the main causes for the fall of great civilizations. While de Gobineau exhaustively adduces every imaginable rationalization for why societal degeneration occurs, Evola selects only a few of these to examine in this chapter, which are the ones that are relevant to the idea of the departure from the rights and the law from above. One of these, which is also among the chief causes that is often cited among students of history for the fall of a great nation, is the loss of morals or loss of religion. De Gobineau dispenses easily with both of these. He says that in dying nations we often see more morality and piousness. One must consider that morals are in a constant ebb and flow, and the corruption of morals is both fleeting and unstable. For all the decadence of the modern world, we do indeed see strongly moralistic attitudes and a puritanical insistence that everyone must follow the rules of the day. 
While what constitutes the ideal of goodness and righteousness may change over time, it is often the case that a dying society will turn to rigid adherence of sanctimonious mores, perhaps in an instinctual attempt to force order where none any longer exists. Neither is the loss of religion the cause. De Gobineau points out that there are virtually no examples of a society that has completely lost its religion, and many go to their doom while fanatically clinging to their altars. There has never been a nation with no religion at all, but rather a continuity between changing faiths, with religious skepticism generally being only a luxury of the intelligentsia. Evola notes that, in almost every instance, we have to agree with Nietzsche, who claimed that wherever the preoccupation with morals arises is an indication that a process of decadence is already at work. He follows up with a quote from the Tao Te Ching. When the Tao was lost, its attributes appeared. When its attributes were lost, benevolence appeared. When benevolence was lost, righteousness appeared, and when righteousness was lost, the proprieties appeared. Now propriety is the attenuated form of filial piety and good faith, and is also the commencement of disorder. The profane and bourgeois morality that arises is merely a symptom of a civilization already far degenerated. It is but a feeble grasping towards that instinct within us to live in accordance with the law from above, despite no longer knowing the way. It is a poor imitation of real virtue. Virtue in the heroic sense needs no moralizing. Evola says, as far as the traditional laws are concerned, taken in their sacred character and in their transcendent finality, then just as they had a non-human value, Likewise, they could not be reduced in any way to the domain of morality in the current sense of the word. The other alleged factor of decline, which Evola treats at length, is also where he takes his departure from de Gobineau. This is the issue of the purity of the blood. De Gobineau explains that to say a civilization declines because it becomes degenerate is tautological, it is not satisfactory to say that a nation dies because it is inherently rotten, which means that it is degenerate, and that it is degenerate because it dies. He says we must explain the term better, and suggests that to be degenerate means that something no longer has the same intrinsic value that it originally did. Thus, the essential quality of a nation alters, when the inheritors no longer share the same essential qualities of the founders. De Gobineau explains that continual adulterations of the blood result in an attenuated essential quality, and eventually the people of a nation are no longer of the same race as their forefathers. He also explains that this racial mixing is both necessary and inevitable in the building of a civilization, that a people cannot successfully conquer and integrate others without a degree of intermixing. He considers that this is the seed in which the inevitable death of the civilization resides. However, Evola rejects this purely material view of racial purity. He says this too is an illusion and lowers the notion of civilization to a merely naturalistic and biological plane. This shallow view of race is born out of anthropological science, which attempted to reduce race to something that could be quantified and measured, completely ignoring the inner essence of man, and attempting to turn the idea of race from something that was once intimately connected to the spiritual life force of a particular stock, into something scientific and reducible to mere genetics. Evola speaks of the inner race, the race of the spirit, 
of which biological race is only an external material manifestation. This spiritual race is the metaphysical christening of what would otherwise be a useless mass of flesh. When this inner race decays and the spiritual chrism that accompanies it is lost, then the biological race is left at the mercy of the forces of the totem and is pulled entirely into the world of becoming. Without a spiritual race to anchor him in the world of being and to provide that vertical orientation and pull him upwards towards the transcendent, the telluric and irrational forces of the world of becoming drag man downward. The loss of religion is not the same thing as the loss of the spiritual chrism. In a literal sense, a chrism is a type of anointing oil that is used in ritual consecration. In a metaphorical sense, it is the qualities conferred on a person who has undergone initiation and is thus symbolic of a person with a true spiritual center, who is authentically in touch with the divine, who is anchored in a state of being, which flows from something supra-rational and supra-individual, from above, rather than that which flows from below, from the totem. Though it is carried in the blood, the spiritual chrism is beyond blood. It has a metabiological character. It is this authentic spiritual center within a people or a nation, this particular set of metabiological qualities which forms the heart of a civilization, and a healthy civilization is structured to strengthen that transcendent connection which lies innate in its people and which is actualized through initiatic rites. This is not to suggest that the purity of the blood was not important in traditional civilizations, but its importance must be placed in the proper context. Evola writes in the introduction of the 1942 edition of his book, Myth of the Blood, that the awareness of the value of race is betrayed already in a whole series of norms which can be found in ancient civilizations, especially wherever the system of castes and the laws of endogamy ruled, norms which in part continued up until relatively recent times in the traditions proper to the aristocracies. This racism was not theorized, but lived. Thus, it rarely happens that one encounters in the ancient world the word race. One did not feel the need to speak of race in the modern sense, because one had race. One was more strongly interested in the mystic forces which could be felt behind the forces of the blood and of the gens, as in the patrician Roman and in general Arya, the cults relative to the Lares, the Penates, and the Archigedes heroes. There was a very clear idea of the necessity of preserving the blood, of maintaining and transmitting a previous and irreplaceable patrimony connected to the blood in its integrity. Therefore, in various cases, the contamination of the blood appeared to be a true sacrilege. We can see here the metabiological view of race as attached to the gens, to the totemic forces of one's lineage. The word race comes from the Latin word radix, which literally translates to roots, that is, one's stock, one's originating lineage that has a continuity of always producing individuals that are similar to each other. This meaning can be seen in the Latin phrase aradicibus evertodomum, which means to ruin one's family completely, and literally translated means to overturn roots. To break the continuity of that lineage was to destroy one's lineage, and was considered sacrilegious in traditional societies because of the disruption to the family totem. This should not be understood in a modern xenophobic sense. When we consider what has been previously said about the traditional family existing more as a religious association rather than one based on biological or sentimental attachments, as well as the traditional view towards adopting a son who is spiritually compatible to carry on the rites if the biological son was unfit for the task, we can only understand this racial view in the spiritual sense. 
caste systems did not exist to breed pure-blooded individuals in the way that one might breed animals, but rather to protect the spiritual lineage within each caste, which was the foundation of the spiritual hierarchy within the traditional civilization. What role, then, does biological race play? We can find many examples in antiquity of the idea that human differences are innate, congenital, or even predestined, because they draw their origins from a state prior to the human state. Perhaps one of the oldest examples of this is the practice of astrology, the idea that people are connected in a supersensible way to the spiritual forces that the stars and planets represent, and which are imprinted on an individual at the moment of birth, and which categorizes people in all manner of different ways, whether masculine or feminine, nocturnal or diurnal, earth, fire, water or air, fixed, mutable or cardinal, and so on. The ancients were certainly not unaware of the material differences between individuals. Evola writes, Blood and ethnic purity are factors that are valued in traditional civilizations too. Their value, however, never justifies the employment, in the case of human beings, of the same criteria employed to ascertain the presence of pure blood in a dog or in a horse as is the case in some modern racist ideologies. The blood or racial factor plays a certain role, not because it exists in the psyche, in the brain or in the opinions of an individual, but in the deepest forces of life that various traditions experience and act upon as typical formative energies. The blood registers the effects of this action, yet it provides through heredity a material that is preformed and refined so that through several generations, realizations similar to the original ones may be prepared and developed in a natural and spontaneous way. In other words, it is an issue of form versus matter. Evola later says we should not mistake the formative element for the element that is formed. The formative elements that act upon the blood are the totem pulling from below and the spirit pulling from above. These two elements converge within a person to varying degrees. Having a pure blood lineage allows for a template for the physical body that is already conducive to house and give expression to the inner race, the race of the spirit, in a way that is consistent and similar to the expressions that have come with preceding generations. However, Evola remarks that in the Indo-Aryan tradition, particularly in India and Persia, it was not enough to have been born into a caste, but rather that the quality that was virtually conferred upon a person by the accident of his birth needed to be actualized by initiation, and until the person had undergone initiation, or the second birth, he was not considered as part of his birthright caste. Thus, the qualities of the actualized spiritual chrism, as well as that of the totem, which act upon the inner race, cannot be explained by blood, but through blood, beyond blood, and that it has a metabiological character. One might here draw the conclusion that preserving the biological purity of the blood is the only way to protect the inner race, and this is in fact not necessarily the case. Referring to the aforementioned metabiological character of the inner race, Evola says, When this something is truly powerful, or when it constitutes the deeper and most stable nucleus of a traditional civilization, then that civilization can preserve and reaffirm itself, even when ethnical mixtures and alterations occur, no matter how destructive they may be. By reacting on the heterogeneous elements and shaping them, by reducing them slowly but gradually to their own type, or by regenerating itself into a new and vibrant unity. In other words, when the inner race of a people is strong and provides a solid foundation for civilization, then any adulterations to the purity of the blood can either be absorbed and integrated through the powerful forces from above, shaping it to fit what already exists, 
or it can serve to create an entirely new people with a reinvigorated spiritual chrism. However, when that something is not powerful, and the spiritual race is burnt out or broken, the downward spiral of the decline of civilization will start to set in. It is at this point that the biological purity of the blood takes on an importance that it would not otherwise be required to have. Evola explains, when it comes to this point, the only forces that can be relied upon are those of the blood, which still carries atavistically within itself, through race and instinct, the echo and trace of the departed higher element that has been lost. It is only in this way that the racist thesis in defense of the purity of the blood can be validly upheld, if not to prevent, at least to delay the fatal outcome of the process of dissolution. It is impossible, however, to really prevent this outcome without an inner awakening. That is to say, once civilizational decline has already set in, due to the loss of the spiritual chrism in the people, the purity of blood can act as a break to slow the fall, because the blood still retains within it the memory of those higher forces that once animated and invigorated the ancestors and spurred them to greatness. It is possible that the atavism of the ancestral spiritual chrism could re-emerge, and if and only if this happens can the process of decline be halted and reversed. Thus, those who are descendants of the people of once great civilizations, who now find their civilization and their people to be little more than walking corpses, upholding the facade of their heritage, but ready to topple over from the slightest blow, may yet find their salvation if they can manage to reignite the supernatural fires within themselves. According to the Vedic tradition, the four ages, or yugas, depend on the condition of the king. In the golden age of the Satya Yuga, the king is awake and active, and reproduces the symbolic actions of the gods through efficacious rites. But in the dark age of the Kali Yuga, the regal function is asleep. Within a traditional order, there must be someone who can assume the role of the pontifex in a regal, imminent, and active way through true spiritual realization, not simply as a figurehead. Every true civilization is said to originate with a divine event, wherein a supernatural force from above acts upon material factors such as race, blood, and hereditary purity. These material factors alone are not enough to build a civilization that can stand as a testament to the Eternal. The Pontifex, the Sacred King, the Chakravartin, the Dharma Raja, establishes the bridge between the world of becoming and the world of being, and allows the supernatural fires to flow down into the rest of society so that they too may experience the formative element from above, lifting them out of the telluric and totemic influences of nature and history, and up into the light of Logos. Without this transcendent regal center, the civilization begins to crumble. The decline is marked by an increasing distance from God, ultimately resulting in a demonic inversion of the sacred hierarchy in which the pyramid is turned on its head, placing truth at the bottom and falsehood at the top. In René Guénon's book, The Reign of Quantity, he describes this final stage as the reign of the Antichrist, which is indeed symbolized by an inverted triangle. While the sacred king, the Chakravartin is the one who spins the wheel and the central axis around which it turns. The Antichrist is furthest from the center, but claims to be the spinner of the wheel, albeit in the opposite direction to the normal cyclical movement. 
Before reaching that point, however, civilization passes through what can often be a long period in which its institutions, laws, customs, and even external forms of ritual may still be in use, but without their true meaning and significance, being relegated to hollow shells of what they once were. At this point, the fate of the nation is set in motion. Without the superior principle from above, all that was once anchored in being becomes disfigured and altered beyond recognition to suit the new degenerated regime of the demos. Some of the ancient grandeur may remain, but only as a curiosity of the past, their esoteric secrets long forgotten. When the echoes of the superior transfiguring forces from above become ever fainter and then finally silent, then we return to the gates where, at the beginning of our story, the forces of Gog and Magog had broken through, unleashing the subterranean and infernal forces of chaos, and replacing the grand and holy empire with a modern mechanized leviathan, a machina machinarum. The significance of Evela's choice to evoke the imagery of the Leviathan at the end of the chapter cannot be understated. While the original Leviathan was a biblical sea monster, it has taken on an entirely new and extremely evocative meaning in the modern vernacular. The Leviathan is something which by its very nature represents a direct challenge to the divine order and ultimately to God. One can look to the Enlightenment philosopher Thomas Hobbes, whose most famous treatise was titled Leviathan. The original cover of the book depicts a king holding a sword in one hand, his earthly authority, and a scepter in the other, his religious authority. This double power is appropriate to a king and a nod to the hierarchy of tradition. But what is odd is that upon closer look, the king's body is made up of a multitude of people, of the demos. The quality has been replaced with quantity. This is not a true king. While Hobbes was grasping towards fragments of tradition, the modern world has marched ever onwards, and the Leviathan has become a colossus with feet of clay. And while Hobbes envisioned his Leviathan as a sort of machine, and where in his age machines still carried an aura of something magical and mysterious, appearing to have a life of their own, a machine is ultimately the product of the human intellect, an artificial creation devoid of a soul. It was in fact an extremely apt metaphor, as the modern Leviathan is but a construction of man's mind, detached from any transcendent connection and the law from above, where the seat of power has moved from truth to mere authority, however imposing that authority may be. The Leviathan is but a pretender to the throne that rightly belongs to the Chakravartan. No Enlightenment-era social contract can ever be a satisfactory replacement for a hierarchy based on the law from above. The natural question may arise in one's mind of how we can stem the tide when all odds seem against us. We mentioned previously that only an inner awakening can salvage one's race or civilization. Evola did not believe that the process of decline could be reversed, only ridden out to its ending with something new to be created from the ashes. In the synthesis of the doctrine of race, Evola provides some further clarification on this subject. He identifies three conditions that must be met. First, a heroic climate is required. That is to say, an environment of high spiritual tension. 
It is this tension which isolates the superior race of the spirit from the naturalistic race of the body. The spirit uses the naturalistic expressions of the body as its raw material, but does not allow itself to be reduced to nature. In this book, Evola writes, a precise opposition between body and spirit, between physical and metaphysical reality, between life and super-life, is the presupposition of this synthesis, because only it can awaken a heroic and ascetic tension, can allow the essential and central element of man to reawaken, to free itself, and to reaffirm itself. It is this high heroic tension that defines the greatness of a people and their civilization, and disregarding this will block the path to higher racial achievement of spirit, leaving one's race to be only of nature, ultimately animalistic and devoid of inner light, no matter how outwardly beautiful or strong. The second condition is what he refers to as the complete myth. This myth must be a powerful idea which galvanizes and shapes the emotional forces of society in a profound and organic way, and he gives an analogy of the imprint of a mother onto her son. This myth functions both as a center of crystallization and as a reagent. He remarks that sometimes the state can serve as the myth, acting as a reference point for heroic devotion and spiritual tension, which is indispensable for not only the rebirth of the spiritual race, but the physical race as well. Finally, the third condition is that of an exemplary human type as an embodied ideal both as a tangible expression of the myth, but also as an approximation to the primordial, divine, and superior type of man. When these conditions are met, a process of evocation, training, and awakening of deep forces begins. Beginning with the spirit and flowing downwards from the divine cosmic order, eventually this process comes to involve biological realities and will eventually, over generations, see the corresponding type of superior man emerge more and more distinctly as the pure race of spirit is reborn and manifested in the earthly realm. The internal conditions of the continuity of the blood from the deep forces of the Gens must be re-evoked. This requires a hierarchical restoration a rebirth from an unbroken line of leaders. The reawakening of the primordial formative forces can only occur with those who can reproduce the classic embodiment of those forces and firmly regain power in the center of their nations. Evola says that the actions of such men will be double. When those who embody the powerful ideas contained within the complete myth and are awakened to the race of the spirit as leaders, then the state, as structured from above, as an earthly reflection of heavenly principles, can re-emerge and thus reorder the rest of society as an animating and vital force. Leaders who are the actualized ideal, the supreme incarnation of the superior race of the spirit, can rekindle a profound latent strength in other individuals, and their very presence in the world can activate the race of the spirit in others. So while we cannot reverse the cycle of history, we can look forward to a new era in which the next golden age will rise from the ashes like a phoenix, sacred to the sun and symbolic of the immortality of the spirit. Just as the phoenix is reborn out of its own dead self time and time again, so too will the spiritual nature of man arise triumphant out of the decay of the modern world. In an essay titled, The Worker in the Thought of Ernst Jünger, Evola wrote about the fatal error of those who think that everything may be brought back to order, that this new menacing world ever advancing may be subdued or held on the basis of the vision of life, of the values of the preceding age, that is to say, of bourgeois civilization. He said that if a spiritual catastrophe is to be averted, Modern man must make himself capable of developing his own being in a higher dimension. The watchword is heroic realism, and the ideal is the absolute person.
capable of measuring himself with elementary forces, capable of seizing the highest meaning of existence in the most destructive experiences, in those actions wherein the human individual no longer counts. This inner awakening that Evola speaks of is of the utmost importance, and why his answer to the modern world so often is ascesis, that is, spiritual self-discipline, for we cannot give shape to life until we know what is beyond life. To do this, we must be able to awaken the race of the spirit, as well as raise and purify the body to be an appropriate vessel for the spirit to act upon it from above. This requires active detachment and heroic overcoming. Without this, the watchwords of heroism, activism, and virility serve only to enhance the feelings of ego and leave one trapped in its prison, unable to ever embody the true Olympian spirit of the primordial ancestors. The options are clear. We can either continue down the destructive path of continuing to fashion different combinations of modern secular thought, falling in love with the products of our own intellect as we play at finding a solution for the ills of the Kali Yuga. Or we can return to traditions and origins which are sacred and spiritual, and form a new spiritual aristocracy that can light the way for others. This is the only possible defense against the unassailable mass of an ever-growing Leviathan. Though the mechanistic juggernaut crushes and absorbs everything in its path, that which gives the Leviathan its gravitas, that is, its sheer voluminous size, is also its greatest weakness, for it lacks dynamism and mobility. When it has grown so large that it can no longer move, then those of us who feel a fundamental incompatibility with this world, who feel as though we belong to another time, must come together and gather at the base of this mountainous mechanized mass and set out to conquer its summit once and for all, having already prepared ourselves internally. When we turn our attention inward, not to escape from the world, but to steel ourselves against it, when we work to become a personal reflection of eternal principles as we strive for our own virtuous redemption, then we have a chance of remaking the world. This is the unguarded path up the mountainside, up the volcano spewing the ashes of the civilizations it has already consumed. Only one who has been shaped by the quest for the transcendent can find the superhuman strength necessary to overcome the modern world. Let us not waste time indulging in anachronistic fantasies, but rather focus on reinvigorating a creative tension that can stir up higher possibilities. While the glowing summit in the distance may seem impossibly far away, we do not make progress towards it by standing still and wringing our hands over the state of the world, but by simply placing one foot in front of the other. The descendants of the Divine Ancestors, now scattered amongst the tribes of the Earth, contain the memory of those heroes who came before, and therein lies the potential to reopen the door to Divine Wisdom and Eternal Life, incorruptible, solar, luminous, and bright. Is this Divine Spark to be found within you? We cannot remake the Golden Age in the world without first remaking it in our souls. We must live as though we are already denizens of a Golden Age civilization, relighting the sacred fire within. One by one, tiny candles will dot the horizon as men and women who are characterized by purity of heart, justice, wisdom, and nobility make their way to the summit and light a beacon for others to follow. Too many modern people remain trapped within the labyrinth of the Leviathan, paralyzed by indecision and fear. There is no beacon that they can see. There is no illumination in their darkness. 
Will you be the one to show them the way out? And so we see the final conflict of our age emerge. On one side, the overwhelming quantity of the mass man and his profane machines, brought to its feverish collectivist peak. And on the other, the world of tradition, the touchstone of universal order and the transcendent quest of man to establish in civilization the highest expression of a different kind of life, defined by its quality, its nobility, and its virtue. The secret for the differentiated man is to not allow the destruction to claim him as a victim, to not become part of the rot or be scorched with anger, but rather to rise above it in the clear light of truth and to carry the torch of tradition ever onward, despite watching the collapse of a decaying world, and to win small, incremental victories over the darkness. For in the words of Gustav Mahler, tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. Yeah. 